of the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, you are the radiance of the Eternal Father. You enlighten the world with your divine teachings, and you filled it with knowledge through the simplicity of your apostles. Make us worthy to praise you as we celebrate the solemnity of your chosen apostles, Peter and Paul. By their witness, may we come to understand your hidden mysteries and keep your life-giving commandments so that we may be made worthy to share in their happiness. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with the church and her children. Praise, glory, honor, and praise to the Father most holy, who sent his only begotten Son for our salvation, and to the glorious Son, who chose Peter and Paul, and filled them with wisdom and holiness, and sent them out to preach, and to the Holy Spirit, who strengthened and supported them in their apostolic mission. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast, solemnity, and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. O Christ, our God, you were sent to us from the Father. You are the High Priest, whom we profess as the merciful and forgiving one. You chose twelve apostles, and by the, your Holy Spirit made them wise. You sent them to proclaim the gospel of life and salvation. You honored Peter and Paul, two of your chosen apostles and true witnesses. Peter and Paul are two temples, and in them dwells the Spirit of God, the Word who became flesh. Peter and Paul are two jewels, adorning the crown of the Holy Church, the Bride of Christ. Peter and Paul are two strong pillars upon which the Holy Church was built. Now, O Lord, we ask you through their intercession and with the fragrance of this incense to look upon us with the eyes of mercy and not to forsake us who implore you. Strengthen the weak, Heal the sick and satisfy the hungry. Bring back those who are far and protect those who are near. Forgive sinners, accept those who repent and pardon our brothers and sisters who have gone to their rest. May we who worship you be united with your chosen apostles, Peter and Paul, and with your mother, the ever-Virgin Mary, and with the choirs of prophets, apostles, and martyrs. You are good and compassionate, and we raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever.
apostles Peter and Paul, as we celebrate your solemnity, we ask you to raise in your own hands the fragrance of this incense, which we have offered, so that it may be a sweet fragrance and a pleasing sacrifice. Through your intercession, may God forgive our sins and favorably remember all the children of the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. With joy from the mountains, the apostles preach good news. Offer praise to the Lord God. May he help us through their prayers. from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. To my shame I say that we also were weak. But what anyone dares to boast of and I now speak in foolishness, I also dare. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? And I speak now like an insane man. I am yet more. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, far worse beatings, and numerous brushes with death. Five times at the hands of the Jews I received forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I passed a night and a day upon the deep, on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, 
dangers at sea, perils among false brethren. In toil and in hardship, through many sleepless nights, through hunger and thirst, through frequent fastings, through cold and nakedness. And apart from these things, there is the daily pressure upon me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is scandalized, and I am not indignant? But if I must boast, I shall boast of the things that show my weakness. Praise be to God always. announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint Matthew, who proclaim life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Apostle Matthew writes, and when Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, whom do men say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said in reply, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him in reply, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I shall build my church, and the gates of Sheol shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he strictly ordered his disciples to tell no one that he was the Messiah. This is the truth, peace be with you.
If I must boast, I shall glory in the things that show forth my weakness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Every single day when we pray the creed, whether it's in the shorter version with the rosary, what we call the Apostles' Creed, or in the longer Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed that we recite every day at Mass, we always profess our belief in the church. A lot of times we don't even think about it, it just slides by. It slides by even with less notice than he descended into hell. These little phrases that are in the creed and their indication that we believe in the Holy Spirit, that we believe in the church, that is an understanding of the church of what the church is as the body of Christ, as Christ. Many of you are aware of the recent polling in the last few years that showed even people who went to church, Catholics who went to Mass, that 70% of them didn't believe in the Eucharist, at least not according to the church's teaching. That's shocking. I would venture to say that the percentage is even much higher if you were to quiz the Catholics about belief in the church. Not belief about the church, not belief in I love the club, but the belief of the church being the vehicle of revelation and being the body of Christ. Not a belief in the church of who are, who are the priests, who are the bishops, who are the popes today, or even yesterday, but of what the church actually is in her very essence, being as our Lord, both God and man. The church is both divine and human. Our Lord could die on Calvary, and the church also herself can be wounded by the sins of her own members, that's clear. But the essential mission of the gospel being preached and the gospel being relayed from generation to generation will always be around. That is what we mean when we say we believe in the church. You're very funny. I once had contact with an individual who said, it was really nice hearing from you, Father, and it would be wonderful to get together as long as you promise not to talk about religion or the church or politics. And I thought, well, that makes a pretty short list for a priest to talk about after that. I don't go to movies, I'm not really following the sales, and I don't spend a lot of time surfing the web, so I'm, video games is out, we're not gonna talk about that. And so you just kind of stand there stupefied saying, well, I don't even know how to even answer this. So when we speak about faith in the church, it's not about the humanity. And a lot of people need to remember that, with the frailties that there are amongst our fellow Catholics, and the frailties that there are among the clergy, and the frailties that there are to be found everywhere. And for heaven's sakes, if you want to find dirt, it'll be endless. You spend the rest of your life finding it. But if you want to find faith and hope and a confidence that God still speaks on the face of the earth, that's a different picture. That is a grace. And so when we recite the creed each day, and we say that we believe in the church, it is this vehicle of the reality upon which, or under which we could say, the two pillars of the church are Peter and Paul. So the icons often you see them, they're beautifully portraying the two of them holding up the church in the center, the princes of the church. And so this aspect of the belief in the church, that's one thing for us to keep in mind, that the church is divine and she will always be around. Catholics will fall away continually, apparently. It seems to be the thing. I've mentioned to you before, when the great persecutions broke out under Diocletian and that, we can, by looking at certain, the historians will judge that, for example, in Diocletian, most Catholics actually apostatized offered sacrifices to the gods and the goddesses, did all these things because you want to save your tail. There's a very human understanding to it. But of course, what happened after it then in the generations that followed is unleashed huge schisms because then these people came back and said, well, we want to come back to mass now after we betrayed our Lord. And those who suffered and some of them who had family members who were martyred, they're like, well, what? You just turn around and walk back in after betraying our Lord. You betrayed the very vehicle of your salvation. 
by renouncing your baptism. This became the source of schisms in the first three centuries. These are huge questions. Because ultimately what it meant for these individuals is the belief in the church, the divine reality of Christ, had disappeared so they could save their jobs or save their lives. And as we said, on a human level, that's perfectly understandable. Who, don't, who wants to die? But on the other hand, it also shows a, a complete betrayal of faith in the mystery of the church. Again, it's why we glory in people like St. Lawrence and St. Sebastian and these great martyrs, because they always saw the church and they wound up dying because they had faith in the church and the reality that this is the vehicle of God's revelation on earth. So that's one thing to consider on the solemnity of Saints Peter and Paul, our faith in the church. But a second thing that we can consider is how the church is patron. Peter. Patron is just the adjective of Peter. And how when the church is founded, at the end of, by the end of the first century, the churches, the mother churches, are Antioch, Rome, and Alexandria in Egypt. They, Antioch is where Peter was actually first bishop for about seven years. So after the persecutions break out around the martyrdom of St. Stephen, then the Christians flee. And they land in Antioch because it was, the, it was the capital of the East. Constantinople isn't going to be around for another 300 years or 250 years. So the place is Antioch. It's even more important politically than Alexandria and, of course, Rome. So everyone flees to Antioch because you have anonymity. The same way that you flee to New York City and reinvent yourself to find your career. Go to LA and reinvent yourself in the midst of the anonymity of just this mass of cosmopolitan population. But of course, arriving there doesn't mean that they're actually a very well organized church. They're just there, they're baptized individuals, they are disciples of our Lord. So Peter goes to Antioch and he organizes the church. He puts it together, gives it a form, and he remains there for about seven years, we're told, I believe by Eusebius. And it's after that that he then goes to Rome. Again, it's not a church that he founded, but he goes to give form to it, and of course, famously, St. Paul will finish his days also in Rome. But of course, he went there in chains. St. Peter goes there to organize his church, and both are martyred by tradition in the year 67, and by tradition in Rome, both on the same day of June 29th. One outside this city in decapitation because he is a Roman citizen, and one because he's not a Roman citizen, so he's crucified in the circus grounds, the stadium that runs kind of diagonal of what's now St. Peter's and the plaza in front of it, the stadium, the hippodrome, the horse track, ran diagonal from the side of St. Peter's, if you're looking forward, from the side of St. Peter's across the, the plaza. That was where the stadium was because there was a hill where the church is now. Constantine is the one that had the whole hill leveled out. So the Vatican Hill disappeared because it filled in the cemetery and then they built the churches upon it. And the obelisk that's in front of St. Peter's when the plaza comes out, that large Egyptian obelisk used to be the center of the island in the middle of the stadium track. It had fallen down, was taken back up, and was put out in the middle of the plaza to indicate the conquering of the church over paganism. That's why every obelisk that has been, that is in Rome, and there's a number of them, every single one of them has a cross on top of it. So what had been for the Egyptians a symbol of the sun and the adoration of the sun, it's, the obelisk is shaped the way it is to represent a ray of light coming down and spreading out. But that obelisk then to show the conquering of the cross of our Lord, on every obelisk there is a cross on top of them in the city of Rome. 
It is one of the reasons why in St. Peter going to Antioch, why if you've noticed in your missals, why in enlisting in the intercessions, in the first intercession in which you name the Pope of Rome, you name the Patriarch of Antioch, you name the local bishop, why you always see the name Peter printed there. Because the Maronite patriarchs always take the name of Peter in honor of recognition that that is where he was really first bishop, was in Antioch, organizing the church. Then he went to Rome, and about 20 years later or so is his martyrdom. So these are fascinating little details. But the entire church is founded then very clearly historically upon Peter. He is a central position within the church. And when I give you that image that on the day of our Lord's appearance and the day of judgment, if there's only 100 people who have been exiled to a South Pacific island, there will be someone there, even if we're all running around in loincloths, there will be someone there in a loincloth who will be the recognizable, visible, historical descendant of Peter in his ordination. There'll be no St. Peter's, there'll be no museums, there'll be no great trumpets or choirs, but he will be the office of Peter. And so the church of Rome being organized by Peter and of course being sanctified by the blood of his martyrdom, that one is very clear, straightforward also. And Alexandria, well Alexandria is known as the teaching of Mark. That's actually the name for the church. The same when we say, we call ourselves Maronite Catholics, but our name is actually Beit Marun. We are the house of Marin, Beit Marun. So in Egypt, we'll talk about the Coptic church, which just means the Egyptian church, but the Copts actually call themselves the teaching of Mark. And St. Mark is the disciple and the interpreter of St. Peter. The Gospel of St. Mark is essentially St. Peter's catechesis that's been recorded and written down. So again, this profound importance. Later on, the other names of patriarchs, like of Jerusalem, and of Constantinople, and of course, as we said, Constantinople doesn't even exist. At the point of St. Peter's martyrdom and St. Paul's martyrdom in that year, what becomes Constantinople at that point in the first century is a fishing village. It's a little town at the end of this peninsula coming out. And it's only in the late 300s when you have a declaration by the church giving the title of patriarch also to Constantinople and also to Jerusalem. In the year 410, so about 20, 30 years after that public announcement, there will be another announcement and declaration of the patriarch of Tessaphon, the capital of the Persian Empire in the year 410. So you have them, that one kind of gets lost in the history of the 400s, but you would have had six patriarchal sees recognized by the church. And the church would have gone on later on and done the same thing. Alexandria is the patriarch of Africa, technically speaking. But as the church would have expanded, you would have had a patriarch, who knows, of Mumbai, a patriarch of Beijing, a patriarch of Bangkok for Southeastern Asia, the patriarchs are just simply to give the idea of who is the head, who is the father, what is the mother church of all these different regions. But the church historically is founded in the patron offices and the patron churches of Antioch, Rome, and Alexandria. So there are little details to consider today as we glory in this man. Actually, we don't glory in this man. We glory in the work of Christ who establishes these offices. That St. Paul, St. Paul is the, he is the patriarch if you want. He is the apostle to the nations. When you read the Acts of the Apostles as we're doing at Mass each day, up until chapter nine, the whole first part of the Acts, almost half and half, the whole first part of it really deals with St. Peter. When chapter nine on, deals with St. Paul. There's 28 chapters. You kind of, it's almost, it's not completely half and half, but it's essentially that. St. Luke tells the story of St. Peter, then he starts telling the St. Paul, chapter nine begins with St. Paul's conversion outside of Damascus. So these two individuals, both internally 
as St. Paul says, St. Peter was for the circumcision, to get the Jews organized as they came to the Messiah, and St. Paul was sent to the outer nations to bring them in. These are beautiful offices that these men occupy. And when we speak about our belief in the church, we recognize these offices still in the church, whether it's with the papacy, which is the most clear, but these offices are part of the essential function, the spreading, the message, the missionary work, the spreading of the gospel, as with St. Paul and St. Peter in his patron office, organizing, teaching, guiding. These are the shepherds that we honor today in this solemnity, and may they intercede for us to obtain for us a more profound prayer, a more profound depth of faith in the reality of the mystery of the church on earth. May their prayers be a rampart to us always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
praying to Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you, out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, St. Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, St. Mary, St. Jude, and St. Jerome. Remember, O oh God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. <laughs> Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Continue with the anaphora of St. Peter, chief, uh, chief of the Apostles, on page 774. 774. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Father, God of peace and Lord of security, Make us worthy to embrace one another with a sincere kiss in the spirit of your unending love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God.
Lord, we bow before you to receive your blessings and assistance, for we are weak and you are the support and refuge of all. We raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, may the light of your face shine upon us. Deliver us from every evil and blot out all our transgressions, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. Truly it is right and just to glorify and exalt you, O maker of all creation. With the angels we glorify you and with voices of praise we cry out and we proclaim. Holy God, the Father, with abundant mercy, because of your love for us, you sent your Son into the world, who became flesh, the ever virgin Mary, for our salvation. He then commanded and instructed them, saying, Each time you celebrate these holy mysteries, you remember my death and resurrection until I come again. I 
coming that saved us, and as we await your second coming, we offer you praise and ask you. On the day when you will come to judge the righteous and sinners, do not condemn us because of our sins, but have compassion and mercy upon us. Turn your face away from our sins and assist us. For this your holy church implores you and through you and with you, implores your Father, saying, As we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. security to your people and peace to your flock. Protect our shepherds, Francis the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, and Gregory John, our Bishop. Assist the priests, the deacons, and all those who serve your Holy Church, so that they may intercede and pray to you on our behalf. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, those who have asked us to pray for them, those who were desired but were unable to make an offering, and those who assist your holy church. Be a shelter and a refuge for them, for you are the Savior of all. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the civil leaders in our country and throughout the world. Enlighten their consciences to bring security and peace to your people. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the Holy Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, Saint Joseph, Saint Jude, Saint Marin and Saint Jerome, and all the saints. Assist us through their prayers and make us worthy of their reward. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the righteous fathers and teachers who have gone to their rest among the saints. Remember those who diligently carried your gospel throughout the whole world and confirmed your holy church in the true faith. Assist us through their prayers and strengthen us in your love. We pray to you, O Lord. Favor, remember, O Lord, our parents, brothers and sisters, teachers, and all the faithful departed here and everywhere who have gone to their rest. Forgive us and forgive them of all sins and offenses. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed. 
granted so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. But the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. from every sin and to accept our offering so that in one spirit we may call upon you praying our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of God. Amen. O Lord, lead us not into the trials of temptation that we do not have the strength to overcome, but deliver us from every evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. With your only Son and with your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo Elokhodachun. O Lord, bless your worshippers who bow before you and implore you. Make them worthy of your mercy and forgive all their sins, for you are almighty and rich in compassion. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One holy Father, one holy Son, one holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth, to him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified. Souls purified by your forgiven love. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for the life of the Lord our God to be the glory of our God. Amen. 
again and again we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
We thank you, O Father, for this gift that you have given us, though we are unworthy. Do not shame us because of our sins, but help and save us, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo el Lord Jesus, stretch forth your right hand and bless your people. Protect them by your victorious cross. Be their shelter and refuge and perfect them with your abundant blessings. That we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your blessed Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Oh!